return to our regularly scheduled program. Please stand by for further details. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hello and welcome to episode number 14. 14. Tyler and Lynch on standby. Uh, thank you once again for uh, checking out the show. Uh, leave a comment, rate it, review it, subscribe it. Sus- subscribe. Subscribe to it yes. would be the proper term, probably. Uh, and a uh, big thank you to 604 Studios and the Comedy Here Often Podcast Network for hosting us as well. Um, no update from Chad Kroger no, yet. No, nothing yet. Uh, but we do have a very special guest today, and uh, uh, I'm a big fan of his music, and I have been for a while. Uh, I also realized that I think I've been saying his name wrong for about a decade. Um, Dan Mangan is Dan Mangan? Art- I've been saying Dan Mangan. I think it's a visual thing. Like you read it, Dan Mangan. Like just because it. Ru- it's like it's like Calgary, and people say Calgary, and then right. It's a visual it, trick, yeah, 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 but not how you actually say it. But the thing is, for nearly a decade, I've been playing his music on the radio <laughs> and telling everybody his name wrong. So you think he's gonna be pissed at us? I or don't mostly think so. you? I don't think so. Uh, he's a good dude. He is. I, I, I think he, he is let such it go. a gem. I think he could let it go. Uh, so we're going to get into that chat here. Uh, we talk a lot about side door access. Make sure you check out this project that, uh, he's been working very hard on and we get into it throughout the conversation, but basically it started as an idea for like Airbnb for concerts is a good way to put it. You know, if you're a, an independent coffee shop, let's say you could have signed up and then, uh, it would connect you with an artist and you could throw a show at your place. Uh, and then it's really transitioned throughout the pandemic because concerts aren't a thing. Yes. Um, but that's kind of like the theme of the chat is pivots. We should just call this episode pivots in all the different pivots that he has made over his career. So uh, let's get into it. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, here's Dan Mangan. Mangan? Mangan. 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 Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out to chat. I'm sure you've been a busy fella since the pandemic hit. As busy as you can be, I suppose. It's been, yeah, I, I feel like I got a desk job, you know, like I, I, <laughs> I turn into my dad, basically. I was saying to Lynch that you're basically uh, Vancouver's like Silicon Valley guru tech guy now. <laughs> well, not, not quite, but uh, it's been this bizarre scenario where like I started this thing kind of as like a labor of love, you know, like just a side project thing. And, uh, it's just spun, I don't, I'm not going to say out of control, but like it's taken my life out of, you know, I just taken over. I, I, I've been making a record throughout the pandemic and I've been able to give it like four hours a week because I'm just spending all of my time working on side door. Um, which is great. I mean, it's, it's really exciting because it's sort of caught fire this, you know, in this span of a couple of years. Now there's like 20 people that work there and it's just uh it's trying to trying to build this company at the same time as trying to serve artists and trying to like build a product that is uh you know brings like a lot of value to artists and helps them make a living so there's a lot of like ethos involved in it and then along the way trying to learn the business stuff i mean i never went to business school or anything like that so you know it's been it's been a lot it's been, (laughs) been a big steep learning curve well, I want to like take it back to like the beginning of the pandemic because it seemed like like you were in Toronto, right? Like you were set to do shows at the Danforth and you got one of them in and then the second one was canceled. Is, is that? That's exactly right. Yeah. Like there was the March 12th, 2020, uh, we had our show and we were like on, you know, kind of on the edge of our seat. Like, is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? Um, and then it did. And it was glorious. It was like the last night on earth, you know, it felt like, you know, like a big like the last big party, it was the last time I was in a room with a bunch of people, you know? Right. And, um, and then the next morning by like noon, John Tory, the mayor of Toronto had sort of called off any gatherings over 50 people or whatever. And it was clear like, okay, we got to cancel the second night. So we had a two night stand and all of our gear was just still on stage from the first night. Cause you don't, you don't tear down, you know, when you have two nights at the same venue. And so we went back to the venue at like five o'clock the next day, in if the gig was going to happen, we would have done a quick sound check or whatever. And, uh, rather than that, we just like had to tear down our gear. So drum, our, our drummer, Don had this great idea. He's like, why don't we just call in a few people with the cameras, everything's set up, the lights are set up the you know, instruments are set up. Um, and we'll just like play a show to nobody and we'll document it. And, uh, so we did. And then we, 
you know, aired it on YouTube or premiered it a couple of days later. And it was weirdly, I was in the chat on the side of the, of, of the, the premiere and I was like giving behind the scenes jokes and chatting with people. And I was like, Oh, this is like strangely rewarding. I'm enjoying this. Um, just sort of like interacting in and around this art, you know, I'd never done like a YouTube premiere before that, that time. And, uh, that was sort of like the inkling, like the beginning spark of like what was to come in terms of online shows for sure for us. Well, it seemed like, like, well, uh, give the drummer credit, not you, but that like, that was a <laughs> quick immediate pivot versus, you mm-hmm. know, I think it took a lot of artists, uh, time to adapt to this digital world that going so well, did that help with the pivot of side door? Because side door, uh, first off, you know, if you want to explain what it is, uh, sure, but yeah. as far as I know, it started as uh, it was supposed to be in-person shows and pivoted to online during the pandemic, um, yeah. but has uh, done it quite successfully versus a lot of uh, other people attempting stuff online. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, like a year before the pandemic, uh, our sort of lead developer guy, Alex, was um, and we were in a meeting and he was like, well, what if we like helped people do shows from home? Like, and they did like streaming shows, but sold tickets for it. And everybody like laughed at him. It was like, like, that's stupid. Like I would never do that as an artist and I would never buy a ticket to someone else's online show. That's so dumb. And, you know, maybe we weren't so snide about it or whatever, but, and then, you know, so the initial concept, think of like Airbnb for shows where it's like any space is a venue. You can sign up your backyard or your living room, your bookstore, your, you know, fancy studio space that you guys have there. Yeah. We're yeah. killing it. Things are going real well for yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Never, never been better. Um, and so, you know, there was essentially, you know, you would artists and spaces would connect, you'd book a show together, you'd sell the tickets and then share the proceeds. And, uh, we ran about 350 shows pre pandemic relaunched in 2019 um, and we had like a big partnership with South by Southwest and we were, we'd book tours down there with a whole bunch of different bands and down to Austin, Texas and everything got canceled like last minute, of course. And, um, we thought for a moment that we were, we thought we were sunk, you know, like here we had this platform that was all about gathering. And that was like the one thing that we couldn't do. Um, and then I had that experience, you know, with at the Danforth and then like a little while later, um, I would say like around the 21st of March, um, you know, at that time, like everyone was doing Instagram live, you know, it was like, like, you know, if you looked at Instagram, it was like, Oh, Chris Martin is playing, you know, everybody, like the whole, everyone in the world, every musician was like, I'm just going to play from home. And there was this big honeymoon period of everyone going like, Oh, wow. Like maybe we'll just go for bike rides and get universal basic income and we'll never have to work again. And we'll all just like <laughs> live harmoniously in art, wash our um, groceries. Yeah. <laughs> And that didn't really happen, but I I put a a link on side door of people who just wanted to like join me on a zoom, basically just like this. And, uh, so I sold tickets for five bucks and I gave away all the, you know, at first I was so terrified to actually take money for an online show because everyone was doing it for free on Instagram, but I wanted to set the tone and see like, you know, is this something people would pay for? I didn't want to keep it. And uh, so like for the first, like, seven or eight weeks, I was doing this on this weekly show and I was giving away all the money to different charities and I'd pick a different charity every week. And then after seven or eight weeks, I was like, Oh my God, you know, what, guys, like I'm going to run out of money. If I, you know, like, I just canceled 45 shows the rest of this year. I think I need to start keeping the money. And everyone was like, Oh yeah, yeah. Keep the money. Um, but, uh, so anyways, I, I just, I did a zoom and the first week it sounded like garbage and it was just like me strumming into a laptop speaker and I hadn't figured out zoom or like what all those settings I needed to do or whatever. And, um, but it was surprisingly rewarding. Like, and at the end, like I could see people were like crying and dancing and it was like, Oh wow, this is kind of special. And I, so like the number one thing that I've learned through the pandemic when it comes to online shows is that like no production spend will replace the feeling of a live show. Like I could give you in this little box on zoom, like the most spectacular, beautiful, like five camera shoot smoke and lighting and lasers and stuff. And the threshold of where it would make you feel is like, wow, that was really cool. But it would never make you feel like you had left the Vogue and just had like a life changing experience the way that a concert can be. And, um, and so rather than worrying about like production value, what we have learned is that 
despite the fact that no production spend will replace that feeling that like, if you just lean really deeply into trying to facilitate an experience that is human and unravels in real time and is visceral and connective and engaging. And that like weirdly through these little boxes on the screen at the end of it, you can like press end meeting and everyone goes like, Oh my God. And people are crying. And it's just like, if you, if you focus not on the spectacle, but on the actual like connectivity. So we've done since then, like over 800 shows, mostly over zoom. And so now on side door, you can, we have like three, like three types of shows. Basically we've got your in-person show, which is slowly kind of creeping back to the forefront, you know, especially down in the States where it's like, open her up boys. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, Florida's uh, killing and it then, for concerts. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're doing great down there. Uh, Florida, Texas. Um, and then the, uh, the other two types of shows are interactive shows, which are like a ticketed zoom portal, basically secure, no zoom bombers, no link sharing. Um, and then we have like a broadcast channel, which is basically very, very similar to, you know, a paid YouTube kind of thing where there's like a video player and a chat and all that kind of stuff. And do you think, like, I look at what Side Door was supposed to be and then what it is now, and you're saying you get these, like, personal, like, experiences over Zoom where you can you can see the audience, you know, crying or whatever it may be. Uh, you look back to, like, the original concept, playing, a you know, someone's backyard and there's 50 people there or whatever. It's a similar idea, like, that, mm-hmm. that intimacy. You're just trying to recreate it online. Uh, is that Absolutely. because that's what you like as an artist, like those experiences or, you know, are you, yeah. would you rather be in a big venue? Like, <clears throat> no, you will. You really tapped into it in that, like, you know, the product changed, like the technology changed and right. how the product works. And like, we had to drastically change how everything looked. Um, but the mission is totally the same. Like the mission of like fostering a sense of community through the shared experience of art in intimate and alternative types of spaces. I mean, the internet is just like the most alternative space possible really. Um, so the, the mission hasn't changed at all. And we have a bit of like an internal motto at the, at the company where we'd say like, um, if your footprint cannot be wide, let it be deep, you know, Fox mm. paw in the snow. The idea is that like, if you can't sell a thousand tickets to a theater, like obviously if you can sell a thousand tickets to a theater, that's, that's amazing. Like very, very few artists can do that. But if you, if you can't do that, have like the most memorable, unforgettable, incredible experience that feels intimate and, and human with 30 people or 60 people or whatever in someone's backyard or in a bookstore or something. And those people will stick with you. Like they will, they will feel so connected to you, not just because they like your music or whatever, but because they had an experience where they were so close to you and they felt like they got to know you and they will tell all of their friends about you and they will, um, they will feel invested in you as a person. They will want to see you succeed. And so it's like about making, if you can't have like a rabid, huge social media fan base or something like make what, what you do have really potent and special. And that's how I built an audience. I mean, there's like this chicken and egg thing in the music industry, right? Where, you know, it's really hard to build an audience without the like sanctioned grace of all the gatekeepers, like managers, labels, agents, publicists, uh, music directors, m- like Lynch. music directors, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> radio, radio DJs, yeah, uh, yeah. always getting in the way, uh, you know? And, um, And so it's really hard to build an audience without the help of these various people. Um, And it's also really hard to get on their radar if you don't already have an audience, you know, like if somebody comes into the, you know, a new song comes on down the pipe for a listening session or whatever at the radio station. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, okay, guys, we got a new song. It's from this artist. Oh, wow. You know, they've got 10 million Instagram followers. They just put out their first record you guys are going to listen to that song, right? Like, you're yeah. like, okay, well, clearly this is catching fire. We don't want to miss out here. Um, and so like, it's, it's not like a, it's not like a terrible thing. Like these gatekeepers are awful people or anything. Like, they're just responding to what they need to do in their channel. And so this chicken and egg problem of like, how does an artist build a fan base if they don't have the gatekeepers and how do they get to the gatekeepers if they don't have a fan base? I got around that. Like, that's what I, that's just how I built my career was playing to like 30 to 40 to 50 people at a time in backyards and living rooms and weird little, you know, gigs all that. I just took anything that I could find. And then eventually 
after like five years of just touring all the time and making like I had these little pockets all over the place, all over the world, like in Europe and stuff where even though I wasn't famous or anything, like people really, like I was selling I, CDs back in, a CD is a back, company. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah. um, and I had like a store on my website. It's just like, I built it myself out of PayPal and I was selling like three to $600 a week in CDs and stuff like that. And it was like, I had no manager or anything. Like I was just sort of doing it all on my own. And then all of those gatekeepers that I previously couldn't have access to were all said, well, who's this kid? You know, and it, it seems like he's doing some things. And I started winning awards and it was, it was sort of like, it, it, that's when it caught fire. And so I, I made my way through the funnel you know, all the artists up here and like, here are the, here are the artists that you've heard of that get any attention. And I made my way through that funnel, but I had subverted the funnel first. Like I had gone around and sort of like tricked it into, into working for me. And so really that's what side door serves to do is to try and subvert that funnel by like connecting you with Carol and Boise and Doug and Calgary and, you know, uh, whoever down in, in Cincinnati or whatever, where you can like literally go and, and just like, you want to go on tour and you like look at Cincinnati and be like, okay, here are all the hosts in Cincinnati and you hover over their, their profile and you see some pictures of their space and you send them a message. And if they're into it and you book a show. And that was like always the hardest thing was when I was booking these like weird little odd shows, you had to like know someone who knew someone who sent you an email address or whatever, or a yeah. MySpace page <laughs> at the time. And, um, and so it was really hard to find these people. And so we just figured like, if we could just make like this big network of like access where anybody can have access to all these different types of people, maybe, you know, we could help artists make a living because the other cool thing about these shows is that they're very low on overhead. Like they're very high on return in terms of experience. And also right. like revenue, like I, I come home from like house concert tours and my friends who had just gone and played like bars were broke and i'd have like a big envelope full of cash and i'd be like look i just made it because it's there's no expenses like oftentimes i'd crash on the couch or whatever i wouldn't be spending money on hotels and whatever money came in the door they would just give it to me and so it was like this it was like this secret you know and i was just trying to when we built side door we're just basically trying to say like anyone could do this like i'm not special like anyone can do this what you know what, what i what i did basically you must have ended up in some pretty like vulnerable positions if you're playing at somebody's house and then sleeping on their yeah. couch that night like that that sounds great and the envelope of cash is cool but i can imagine there was some nights where you're like i'm not really sleeping someone standing yeah. over top yeah. of you just looking <laughs> yeah. at you sleeping i remember i remember one time like ending up and the other thing i used to do when i was young and I was like, if I didn't know where I was staying that night, like from the stage, I'd just be like, I don't know where I'm staying tonight. If anyone has like a couch, I can crash. So God, like, come on, so really? Terrifying. After the show and like, yeah, I mean, and so I remember one time ending up sleeping on a couch in someone's dorm room, some college campus somewhere. And they're, they, I'm on like a couch. They're like in their bed. They're like 10 feet away from me or whatever. And they, I, you know, unbeknownst to me, apparently they like to sleep to the loudest techno music, like, <laughs> <laughs> like cranked, like so loud. And I, I like, you know, I was so thankful that they had given me a place to crash. And I was so like, I didn't want to like ruffle any feathers. So I just like, didn't, I just like, didn't sleep. I thought like, I couldn't bear myself to get up and ask them to turn it off or whatever. I was thinking back, I mean, I, today I would just be like, goodbye. Right. But, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you know, that's I a weird it, thing to do to sleep to techno music. Like that's, that, that's a, like a form really of torture. Loud. Like the, like, that's yeah. not That's normal. what they do at Guantanamo, you know? Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there was some precarious situation, but like, you know, in terms of side door, we built in, there's a lot of double opt in. There's a lot of like setting up expectations on both sides. Um, you know, because you, when you are in these sort of like DIY alternative space situations like there isn't always a green room or there isn't always somewhere there where the artist can kind of escape and be on their own so we put a lot of that into the vetting process of like does your space have a have a place where the artist can be alone you know does it have a merch table set up or whatever like and so you kind of tick all the boxes and then as you're searching for places you can you make sure that like you know you're, you're finding the right kinds of places that makes you know kind of make sense for you 
um, and setting up expectations. Like before we even built the platform, we ran a couple hundred of these shows just with like spreadsheets and emails and phone calls and wire transfers and stuff. And, um, and so through that process, you know, we're sort of like figuring out like, okay, what are the, what are the deal breakers on these? And like, what are the, what, what are the things that everybody needs to be aware of leading into it so that it's just, everyone's set up for success. When you think about like the, uh, the, the pandemic as a whole, like obviously artists, I would imagine yourself included are missing the road in general. But when you look back on like that period of your life where you're sleeping on people's couches, <laughs> listening to techno music all night, I'm sure, I, and I feel like this happens in every career. Like, I'm sure that's a point where right now you can look back on and you're like, that's a fun story. I'm glad I did that, blah, 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 blah. But it's kind of like uh, the engineering student who now works at the engineering firm and looks back on their university days and is like, oh, that was fun. But in the moment, not necessarily, you know, like mm -hmm. you're staying up all night studying, blah, blah, blah. Like, or I look back to when we, I did radio in Wainwright, Alberta. And um, now, uh, especially after getting fired, I'm like, oh, that was a great time, you know? But I was making yeah. $27,000 a year and was shit poor broke, you know? Like, but with oh, rose-colored yeah. glasses, you look back on it and you're, I do, mean, you, do you actually yeah, miss I, those days? Like, if the opportunity to do a house tour right now came up, would you do it again? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I no, I probably <laughs> yeah, would. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I probably will at some point as like a publicity stunt for Side Door. But like, <laughs> I... You know, there is something really great about it, but you're right. I mean, but the same thing happens when you look back at your youth in general. Like when I think back to like, I see a picture of myself in my twenties and like, you know, I, I might've been doing something. I might've been like trudging through train stations in Europe with like a merch bag and a guitar and feeling very Jack Kerouac and <laughs> young and like sort of taking on the world and stuff. Um, but I think back to who I was in my twenties and like, I was a way shittier person than I am now, you know, like and I, I wouldn't go back. It's like, you know, anyone who wants to go back to high school because that's where their life made sense. Like beware those people, <laughs> right? You don't yeah. want to go back. You want to go forward. And, um, but those, those are formative experiences. Like, you know, I, I remember showing up for a gig in, uh, Nelson and, um, I was going to go stay at this youth hostel. And so I go to the youth hostel and there's like nobody at the front desk. I'm sort of just like wandering around this youth hostel. I got my bags and my guitar and someone's, and I see someone, I'm like, Hey, do you know what the deal is? Like, how do I sign in? Like, you know what? I, and they're like, Oh dude, like the guy who runs this place, I think he like embezzled some money. And now he, <laughs> he just like, he emptied the cash box and like went to Mexico. So now we're all just staying here for free. <laughs> <laughs> and like people were just like squatting in this youth hostel. And he's like, yeah, there's a bunch of keys on the wall over there. Just grab a key and go find a room. <laughs> and like, you know, I think back to those days and I was at the time, I was like, yeah, sweet Bohemian. Like let's set up a commune and play music and bongos together. You know, like, um, I don't know. Like it, it was a different time. And when you're young, like you kind of have to, every time you expand your horizons and you don't die, you grow. Right. Like right. I remember when I was like 18 and I, my friend was like, yeah, we should go backpacking after we graduate high school. And I was like, yeah, let's, you know, and we saved up money and we were working little part-time jobs. And so we, uh, we like went to New Zealand and like we flew to New Zealand and we didn't know where we were going to stay on the other side. Like we just like, we like arrived in Auckland and then we're like, you know, and like thinking today, like you, I, like you wouldn't book a hotel or a hostel or whatever. Like we literally got on a flight and then we did the same thing. We like flew to Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. And we were like ride, driving around this little circular island called Rarotonga. I was, we rented motorbikes. I'm wearing like a, like a, like a wife beater and like board shorts and flip flops, no helmet ripping around this <laughs> island. I like, you know, my mother's worst nightmare. <laughs> and like, I, it's, I just think back and I'm like, what an idiot, first of all, but in the moment I was like living, you know, I was like expanding. Right. And it's like, we just went across the world and there were some weird, scary situations where we were worried we were going to get mugged and stuff. And like, but we survived and we learned things. And I don't know, like you have to, you have to stretch your limits. Otherwise you just live a very safe life that never really gets anywhere. You know, like I, same thing with like, even on, with side door, like, you know, I, I, we've raised like 
couple million dollars in investment money and stuff to build this company based on the concept and the idea that it could be this like global marketplace. And like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, I, you know, we're just figuring it out as we go and making mistakes. And then it's like, you have to have some insatiable appetite for something you don't understand. And then more and more and more, the more you do it, you start to understand little bits of it. And, and weirdly, like, everything is connected to like, I, I have this belief that there's no wasted knowledge that like, if you're a great gardener, somehow that will make you a better accountant. And right. like, if you spend a year, um, you know, working in like a coal mine, somehow that will make you a better film director or whatever. Like it all is interconnected. And all of the experience I've had in like building a career in music has fueled my understanding of how to build a business in, in the, in the tech realm. Right. Um, it almost provides you with a skill set. Like I think of, uh, like I think my mom, I hated school. Uh, I would imagine probably all three of us did. Yeah. Um, but uh, my mom always said like, you're just going to school to like learn how to learn. Cause like yeah. my argument was always like, I'm never going to use any of this, you know? Yeah. Um, and when you're on that motorbike on that Island, like you're, le- you're learning like a critical thinking skill set. You're like, I need to figure this out for survival and that can apply to what you're doing right now. You're like, I need to figure out this internet world for survival during the pandemic. And uh, it seems like those lessons, uh, you've learned how to pivot uh, in many ways and uh, shapes and forms throughout your career. And in some ways, like I always did that. Like I, it's weird. Like I, in, I have a crazy sort of like broken family, various marriages and stuff. And there was a time when I was the youngest of six. And then there was also a large period of my life where I was basically an only child because all of the other kids were gone. And also when I was a kid, we moved constantly. Like we were moving like every year or two for my whole childhood. So I was always the new kid. Like every school I ever, you know, like I was always Dan, the new kid, because I never stuck around long enough to not be the new kid anymore. And, you know, also like in elementary school, even if you've been there for four years, but you weren't there in grade one when everyone else started, like you're still kind of the new kid, you know? Right. And so I just got used to sort of adapting to the environment around me. And I think it was, it's partly just like, it's, it's all I've ever known. It's like this idea of like sort of landing somewhere and then quickly getting a sense of everyone and then like assessing the room and then like, okay, how do I fit in here? you know, what is, how do I, you know, not end up getting bullied or whatever? <laughs> like, do, do you think that made you a better storyteller? Cause like, obviously in your music, uh, uh, I would, there's a lot of storytelling throughout your, your albums and your songs. And I think back, I, I was a similar situation, moved around a lot as a kid. And, uh, like I, my dad passed away when I was pretty young and I just rem- think that really helped me develop my style of storytelling. Cause I'd get to a new place or a new school and then I have this story that a lot of kids couldn't relate to. And I had to figure out a way to tell it that didn't like make them think I was the weirdo. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it, right. it, it kind of taught me, uh, do you think, uh, that apply that aspect of your life comes into why you're such a storyteller with your music? Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I, I never really thought about it too much, but I do, I do think that like, um, all of the experience, I mean, I have a song called basket. Um, it's all about kind of, you know, staying lucid as long as possible. I watched my grandfather, uh, kind of before he actually passed away, there was like a good period of like 10 years where it was sort of like, he was kind of not all there, you know? Right. And I was thinking about how sad that was. And, um, I remember when I was like a kid, like I'd go over to my grandparents' house and there was like this little cupboard and I'd open it up and I'd pull out, there'd be like a deck of cards and little pack, you know, checkers and like all these little games and knickknacks and stuff. And that was sort of like the kid drawer. And beside it, there was this, this little bin and it was just full of like letters and cards, right? Because back in grandparents day, like that's what you did. You wrote people letters and then you would keep them. And so there was like this thing full of letters and cards and stuff that my grandmother or grandfather was keeping. And so as my grandfather's like mind was sort of deteriorating, I, I, in my mind, I was thinking about that little basket and how like all of those little cards are like entries. They're like little experiences. Like, mm. you know, this is the time you got kicked in the nuts in grade four. And this is the <laughs> time you, you know, uh, ran away from the bees at the lake or whatever. And like all these little experiences, every tiny little thing 
that you've ever done, even the stuff you don't remember that are totally subconsciously baked into you, they have completely uh, forever affected who you are. Like they've, they've taught you like a little tiny lesson. You said, oh, I'm not going to do that again. Or, you know, whatever, like all of those experiences have made up the sum of what you are in this moment. And so what happens if that basket starts to fall apart and those cards and those letters and those stories start to fall out of the basket? If you don't have your stories, are, you know, are you the same person or are you, you know, just a shell or whatever? So that was sort of like the foundation of that song. And so I think in some ways, like that's all of us, right? Like we don't, I mean, also we don't, none of us truly understand exactly how we've been shaped in ways that we don't know, you know, like all of our biases and something that somebody said to us when we were three totally shaped our, you know, racism or whatever, whatever it is, like, you know, all of the little weird biases and pre, you know, presumptions that we have about what the world looks like and why, um, it's all formed whether we know it or not, you know? Right. With your creative process, it's fascinating to hear, like you saw this basket and it led to this kind of, uh, conceptual idea that then led to a song. Uh, do you approach a lot of, uh, your writing that way? Like I, for example, like more or less, obviously I think, you know, that I'm a pretty big fan of your music. Uh, so I look back at the last record and, uh, I don't like to put a theme on it. Like it's not my decision to, or my place to tell people what this is about. Mm. Um, but it feels like there's a lot of themes of almost what we were talking about, looking back at your youthful life and how it has changed drastically throughout the last record. Like, do you approach most things from like a theme like that and then write, or is it? Yeah. I mean, part of it is like, write What you know, like I, I there was a, a moment in 2015 where I wasn't sure if I had more songs in me, I was sort of like a little bit burnt out on music and burnt out on the industry. And I was kind of like, Oh, you know, I kind of wanted your job. I was like, maybe I can just go down to the CBC and see if they'll give me like a job, you know, co-hosting some show or something. You'd be great at it. Yeah, you would. Well, thanks. But I, do you have a university degree? Cause I think you have to have one to work at the CBC. So I do, I do have a bachelor Ah, in in English. Yeah. I'll never be there. Um, (laughs) You know, I, uh, like I always liked it. I always like going to this radio station and like seeing you guys operate the little desk and, you know, you know, calling up the next song. Like I was like, Oh, that, that looks fun. I could do that, you know? And, um, and so there was a moment where I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't do music anymore. And as I worked through that existential crisis, um, you know, that right, what, you know, and like, what, what do I know? I know the fact that I used to be this like sort of globe trotting troubadour kind of acoustic guy and um now i'm really not that guy anymore like i i have a much more domestic life i have two kids i mow the lawn i you know water the lawn i spend a lot of time on that lawn um <laughs> and uh and so the the record was me kind of reconciling those two existences like the 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 before kids and the like you know have no social life unload the dishwasher and sweep the floor constantly kind of existence. And, um, I was trying to reconcile those two worlds a little bit. And so I think that that's, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of the themes of that. I think that when I'm approaching a song, like if I have an image or an idea in my head of like something nagging at me, like if I, you know, if there's something that I can't, I can't sleep at night because there's like something bugging me or whatever. Um, and then if you have like a, a feeling or it could be like a color even, or just an image or like a something that's hard to articulate and you know it to be true. Like this thing about existing that you deeply, deeply, deeply know is like a, like a, a hidden truth of living. And it's very hard to articulate exactly what it is. Then I know, okay, I've got a song brewing because all you have to do in a song, you don't have to say what the truth is. You just, point at it from five or six or seven different directions. So through the, through the verse, it's like, I'm going to point at this little truth. And then in the chorus, it's like, this is the truth. And then, you know, you kind of funnel some form of like, um, like hypothesis or like thesis statement into the chorus. And then you get back to a verse and you start pointing at it again. And it's almost better if you never properly exactly say what it is, but you keep pointing at it in different ways. Like, you know, a song like Lay Low or something. If 
the uh, if the sort of thesis statement of that song is like, I've been to parties, I know what I'm missing out on, and I'm okay with it. Like I'm I'm I'm, I'm happy to stay home because, you know. So then you 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 point at it from all these different you know everything all the time everywhere what to say where to go best of times I'm a little unaware who's to say I don't know like just sort of you know the, it's sort of like you're 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 hinting at a feeling you're hinting at like a a vibe and then all you have to do is send that out into the world and then if somebody hears that song and they go oh man like I feel the exact same way. And I've never heard it articulated quite like that. Now a cosmic connection has been made. Like I'm less alone in my existential dread because somebody else has understood me. And someone else is less alone in their existential dread because they feel understood having heard me articulate their feelings back to them. And so that is like, I mean, that's, that's why art rules. Like that's why, you know, no, nobody goes to Rome to check out the cookie cutter cul-de-sacs. They go to Rome to check out the culture, you know, right. like people go to Paris. They want to see the culture. They want to see the art. They want to, and it's because art makes us feel understood. And when we feel understood, we feel less alone. And when we feel less alone, we feel like we can fucking cope with existing. And right. that's it. Like that's all art is doing is like filling in the gaps and making us all feel a little bit less alone. But I think like most like great art, whether it be music, <clears throat> sorry, or uh, comedy or whatever it may be, is uh, it expresses, I always kind of use the term like emotion is universal, but then situation is unique. Mm. So if you go through like a, a situation, yeah, that's very personal to you and that could be your story, but the true art of it is portraying that emotion that you were feeling because everybody's felt that emotion. Like, it, you know, it could be a story about, as I mentioned, my dad passing away, but someone yeah. could relate to it because their goldfish passed away. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, like it's how you experienced it is the yeah. personal part. Well, and um, if you like, so like, let's say you're, you're in class yeah, and you have this story, this is part of your narrative, your father passing away, you know, when you were really young, that's like n stitched into who you are. Mm -hmm. And then another kid in class, you know, let's say their, their father passes away. There is going to be a big part of you that wants to go and like console that kid totally. because you know, their pain uniquely. Right. Right. And that's like a very specific instance. But in a more sort of, even like in a more like sort of like vague way, like that's how we all kind of feel all the right. time. It's like, you know, you see like a homeless person really struggling with a heavy bag and they're trying to get somewhere and they can't get a cart up the stairs or whatever. And you're like, I don't know that. I don't know that unique situation. I've never been homeless. You know, I'm very fortunate. I've never, but... I know the feeling like I just can't get a fucking win. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I do know that feeling. And, uh, and so in that way, like you want to help them because you want them to not feel that, that way. Right. It provides and, you the, uh, a stance for empathy. Yeah. And here's mm. the secret of life. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel after you help them? You feel fucking great. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's that's like, how you feel after you help someone. It's out. like a reward. You feel great. It's like, and there's no, you don't have to worry about altruism. Don't worry about it. Be selfish in your kindness. Be kind to other people because it makes you feel awesome and it makes you happier. And then your life is better because you were kind. It's like, it's like a, this idea that kindness is a zero sum game where it's like, if I'm kind, kind to them, then I'm, I must be unkind to someone else or something. It's like this un, this bountiful, like, sustainable ever you know ever bursting orb of power is kindness and love and generosity like all of these things like it, it just makes you feel happy and that's great like, it's the ultimate act of like selfishness and selflessness at the same time like to totally. be selfish selfless is almost a little selfish because of the way it makes you feel and you know yeah. that you're going to get that outcome yeah. Um, speaking of like, you know, these are like, you've really segued into the, the television or movie. Like, it just seems like you're doing more, uh, like scores, scores. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that something that you've always been interested in? And that's just another layer to, to your writing. Yeah. It's funny. It fell into my lap. So in like 2012, um, my wife was pregnant and we knew we were going to have a kid and I've been touring 
like 200 days a year for six years. And I was just toast. Like I just had nothing left in me. I remember saying to my manager, like, you know, I, I need to take a break from touring. And he's like, okay, that's fine. And he's like, and I, th- I was like, I, know I, I would do like one-off gigs and stuff, but I, I basically said, I didn't want to go on tour for a full year. And, uh, and so like literally within a week, I got a phone call from a producer friend who was like, Oh, I have another, there's another producer I know who's looking for a, you know, a songwriter to score their film. Is that something you'd be interested in? I can connect you guys. And I was like, yeah, I'd never done that before, but why not? That sounds, that sounds really interesting. And so that was sort of, it just, I, I scored this film, uh, Hector and the Search for Happiness with Simon Pegg and Tony Collette and John Renault and Stellan Skarsgård and all these big stars. And it just literally, it just fell on my lap. It was the craziest project. Went to Berlin and like recorded this orchestra just outside of Berlin and Babelsberg and wild, you know, like being on set with Simon Pegg and, you know, legitimate movie stars. And, um, and so because I had done that, now that was like my calling card because I'd scored a feature, like a Hollywood feature film. Um, now I could go and submit for other things. And so I started submitting tracks for like Hilda on Netflix and unspeakable on CBC and AMC. And it was like this weird, you know, and and I kind of invested, you can see me in my studio here, like throughout that period, I was investing in being able to make music from home and not needing to rely on other people. And, um, just getting better and better at that. And honestly, I never expected that I would do it. It was never part of my, Oh, one day I want to score films or anything like that. I will say it is really rewarding. It is an incredible amount of work and it's very humbling because in my music, it's like, I'm sort of the dictator. I can kind of say what I want to happen or whatever. But in this you're like a cog in a much bigger wheel. It's not your baby and it's not your money on the line. So you really have to play your part. You really have to like be a part of this bigger machine, which is also really fun. And there's something a little bit, it's kind of like a relief, you know, like those like less pressure just on you. Um, And it's kind of fun to be a part of a team these days. I just don't, I don't know how I would find the time to like work on a project like that, just with side door and making my own new record and stuff. But one day I would like to get back to it. and. The other thing that I've learned is that I'm not cut out for animation. Like I, I did several episodes of Hilda for Netflix and the show is super cool. Really, really proud of the music I made for that. But I feel like I had to work five to 10 times as much and as hard as any other project I've ever done to like, I had to squeeze the fruit so much harder to get to the end result when it came to the animation stuff, just because I'm not like a trained, I can't, I can't even like read music really. And with, uh, with the animation stuff, like, Oh, they're little, you know, when their eyebrow goes like this on the screen, can you go like, you know, it's just not the kind of work that I love. I I love the more subtle nuance, sort of like set a tone kind of thing. So it's been, um, again, but it's, it's made me all, it's made me stronger in the studio. It's made me a better producer. It's, uh, in many ways, like I'll have, I'll throw a bunch of ideas at a director and I'll be like, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And they'll be like, that's great. That's great. I don't like that. And then every time they don't like it, it goes into like a folder on my computer, like cool idea for later. <laughs> and inevitably they always make their way onto a record because, you know, it, they didn't work in the, in the project that I was working on, but I got to, you know, score it for myself. Did you find that when you were doing those scores and stuff, you, uh, you met like some, some big opportunities out of those scores that would affect your music? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, because I did the, like I ended up at Dave Grohl's house because of it, you know, like, um, yeah. how, <laughs> how, <laughs> well, so the, the director of the Simon Pegg film, uh, a guy named Peter Chelsea, he, his kids go to the same school as Dave Grohl and they've become pals. And so, um, Dave was going to, you know, we were going to pitch Dave on the idea of doing something for the film. And, uh, so we go down to his house in Los Angeles and he like, he's wearing like a ripped t-shirt. It's like Sears repairman. Like, <laughs> you know, he's wearing cargo shorts. He's eating a microwave, like a, not even a nice burrito, like a 75 cent, like gas station microwave burrito, like <laughs> yeah. very, very, very normal dude, except that he's 
you know, one of the, one of the most like iconic rock gods of modern times. Um, and super sweet guy, we watched the film together and he's like, yeah, great. What do you want me to do? So anyway, he sang on uh, one of my songs on the song vessel, uh, which got played on the peak probably before your era, uh, quite a bit, but, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, it's, it was a crazy, crazy weird thing. You know, Dave Grohl sang on my record uh, and he had a record coming out, like a Foo Fighters had a record coming out shortly thereafter. So his team was like, you can't put it in the press release because they didn't want me to like use up his juice. You know, I mean, not that, I mean, the guy's got an unlimited amount of juice, but yeah. Um, so, you know, we had to be kind of covert about it, like put it in the liner notes kind of thing. Right. I but, remember, I remember that coming down, like when we were playing the song being like, you're not, it, Dave Grohl's in this, but like, don't, don't backsell it as Dan Mangan and Dave Grohl. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, it, was cool very, it was kind of like a tender touchy thing, but right. do you still keep in contact with him at all? Or is it just like one and done? I have his phone number. I text him right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, to be he honest, you like, <laughs> that guy does so many things with so many people. Yeah. I like, even though he sang on my song, I wouldn't be surprised if he like forgot my name and forgot he ever did it, you know? Right. Um, there was one, I like, I, I, if I'm going to be in Los Angeles or whatever, I'll text him and I'll be like, Oh, I'm coming to town. Like, I don't know if you're around. Um, and most of the time he just like, doesn't respond, but then every once in a while he will and be like, Oh, Hey man. Like, and he's just super nice and friendly, like, cool. Like, you know, it's, I, I, I I'm just so, um, maybe it's like the Canadian part of me, but I'm so cautious of like, I don't want to like, use up his time. I don't know. You know, like right. I, I, maybe if I was like a little bit more networky, I'd, I'd sort of be more on it or something, but I, um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I never want to come across like just one more person trying to get at Dave Grohl or something. So, um, I do have his number, but you won't text him right now. No, I won't. Text him. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler and Lynch say, Hey, what's yeah. up? hey man, <laughs> come on our what's podcast. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to be on the podcast right now? Here you go. Um, well guys, I actually have to jump for a meeting. So, uh, we were just going to say, we're going to let you go. Anyways, we're out of time here in our studio too, but, uh, thank you so much for giving us uh, the time to chat today. We appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, well, when the, when the new record guys... is out, make sure you let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, Thanks for having me on the show. I'm sorry you guys were unceremoniously uh, <laughs> released from your duties, but uh, always enjoyed having you on the morning show there. And I'm glad that you're continuing to forge on in, uh, in new ways. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what? There's no way of knowing what all of these, all of this work you guys are putting in to, you probably had to figure out, you know, lighting and, you know, probably learned a bunch of new tech to make this all come together and it's totally. all going to serve you one way or another. And you have no idea at this point, you will look back on this moment and be like, God, I was such a dumb were we for trying to do this podcast thing, but it worked out and it all, you know, got into, took us into all these cool places. So good on you. And, you know, look forward to seeing where it goes. Well, we'd Most like definitely. to have you on Thank here you. again too, because we do have a ton more stuff to talk about, but uh, yeah. Yeah. future date, I got more questions, but thank yeah. you for the kind words. It's much appreciated. Maybe, maybe and, once uh, the, uh, once the record is uh, ready to release. Sounds perfect. I can't wait to listen to it. So awesome. uh, we'll let you go. Have a great day. Have a good meeting. Uh, tell Dave we say hi. And uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll, uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All see right. you, brother. See ya. There you have it. What a guy. What a guy. Uh, got deep there. Yeah. A little bit. Good conversation, though. He's busy, hey? He is a busy guy. And uh, if you haven't listened to any of his music, I mean, the last record, more or less, was I wanted to get into how he, he made my girlfriend cry for the first time. Like the first time I ever saw my girlfriend cry was because of Dan Mangan. I could talk to Dan for at least another hour straight. I have so many questions left to ask. Yeah, him. we just go through our list. Of, we're going to definitely have to have him on again because there's questions like, did you meet uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton? Yeah, he played uh, Canada Day celebrations in what? Was it 2011 in Ottawa? I don't when, know the when they were dates. When they were on their honeymoon. Right. Did yeah. you meet them? I don't know. I'd love to hear that. There's so many more. There's a Snoop Dogg, Willie Nelson story. There's I know. A, we didn't the, even touch do, base on that one. How does he know Sarah Silverman? Uh, so many questions. So we'll have to have him on when the new record is out. Uh, his last record, more or less, uh, is one of the most beautiful records I've uh, ever listened to. So go go check it out. And the story of making my girlfriend cry, back to his whole, uh, like, doing a script, or scripts, uh, 
scores and stuff like that. They did like this beautiful acted out video uh, to one of the songs from the last record. I think it might have been Lay Low or Just Fear. Either way, uh, I played the video for my girlfriend and she sobbed on the ground. Uh, she dropped down? Yeah. In like in the fetal kitchen, position? Fetal position crying. And that was oh the my, first way time to I go, ever Dan. saw her cry. Way to so go. Dan made my girlfriend cry before I did. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. A uh, big thank you to Jim Bob John for the original music, Jessica Wong for the graphics. Uh, producer Alexi is here uh, producing the whole thing, so thank you. And uh, a big thank you to Comedy Here Often Podcast Network for hosting us once again in this beautiful facility. And um, thanks to you as well. Yeah, for watching and listening. And as always, email tylerlynch at gmail.com if you have any guest requests, especially with Canadian artists. We have some pretty good access there so uh, we'd love to hear who you want to hear on the podcast and um that that's it chad kroger we will see you soon probably hopefully, hopefully.